Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. Today is all about Napa Valley Cabernet, and we are featuring three of the most iconic Cabernets of Napa Valley, and the winemakers are here to taste and talk about each wine. If you purchase this trio from Wine.com ahead of time, fantastic. Please go ahead, get those bottles open, pour them into some glassware. This is the kind of tasting you really want to have each wine poured side by side so you can compare and contrast. Also, these are big wines and they will evolve in your glass um, through the tasting today. Plus, they will last definitely a few days. So please get them open. You can enjoy a Cabernet all week long after this. Um, delicious. So if you don't have the wines, that's okay because we still have this trio available on wine.com and this video lives on on our wine.com YouTube channel uh, forevermore. So um, Napa Valley, super excited to be talking about Cabernet here, the king of red grapes, um, so well known in Napa. You know, Napa has a decent history of growing grapes. It's nothing like Europe by any means, but decent for new world, but it's only been the past four or five decades that this place, this region has grown to become the premier wine growing region of the United States and, and definitely also within the world um, highly sought after, especially when it comes to Cabernet. So Cabernet and Napa kind of go hand in hand. So we're tasting three wines from this valley. As you can see, the valley has um, a few different mm -hmm. subregions, And so we're tasting three wines that kind of represent the diversity of this valley. And those wines in order will be the Joseph Phelps Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, the Duckhorn Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, and the Chimney Rock Stag's Leap District Cabernet Sauvignon. So we're also terribly excited to have the winemakers from these three properties here to talk about the wines with us. They are some powerhouse women of Napa Valley making powerhouse wines. So let us introduce uh, winemaker Joseph Phelps, Ashley Hepworth, Duckhorn winemaker Renee Airy, and Elizabeth Viana, winemaker general manager of Chimney Rock. Hello, ladies. Hi. Hi. We're excited Hi. to have you here um, and uh, talking uh, with us about all of your wines. Okay, um, so we're going to just jump in to start tasting, um, but excited to have you all here. And so Ashley, I, we're going to start with you. We're starting with Joseph Phelps. So first, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you so much for having me. And I just want to say quickly before I sort of dive into the history of Phelps that it's a total honor to be asked to do this and let alone be amongst, um, you know, Renee and Elizabeth, who I consider friends and colleagues and I've watched them gain giant success over the years. So this is super fun, I think, for all three of us to be together. Good. Um, so this is exciting. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, Good, good intro. You, thank you for doing it. <laughs> Joe, wow. um, you know, Joe was a builder. And when he, um, he decided to open an office in Burlingame in the early 70s and moved up to um, Northern California and often came to the Wine Valley, to the Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley, and really fell in love with the area. He was asked to, um, he was sort of awarded the bid to um, build Souverain Winery and then Chateau Souverain. And that sort of led him to our little hamlet that we call Spring Valley here in St. Helena, where the winery is. And in 1973, he purchased the land, which used to be a cattle ranch, and really went gung ho on building a winery, started planting, and as Joe did, just dove right in and did it with gust, gusto. So, um, <clears throat> He was really widely recognized, I think, um, you know, as a leader early on in the history of the Napa Valley, but for sure, very humble. I mean, Joe always knew he had so much to learn from anyone around him. I think one thing that Joe did early on um, was really purchasing fine properties throughout the Napa Valley. So today we have over 400 acres and nine estate vineyards, seven of which we use to source Fruit for insignia and the Napa Valley Cabernet. Okay. <clears throat> and so, yeah. go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say kind of, so he comes in, I, I love this, that he kind of started somewhere and, and got his feet wet doing this, but I would love for you to kind of touch on two of just kind of 
what was the philosophy, I guess, going into making um, Cabernet? And also, yeah. I think Joe's philosophy um, maybe originally wasn't necessarily Cabernet. It was more a broader picture about um, he always went into any project or anything he was working on with anybody to the most excellent. So he was never going to do anything halfway. He was always going to do it well and do it to the very end. And so um, we like to think of him as just his tireless, his tireless pursuit for excellence. And I think he really instilled that in all of us. I, you know, I sort of think of him, um, I knew Joe very well. And every time we achieved something or finished something, he would always say, you know, go back and do it again and do it better. So that's where we always had that drive. And I think that's sort of his philosophy. And I think, you know, it catapulted into Cabernet and Insignia and Bacchus and all of the projects that um, we've all been a part of over many years. Yeah, it's still family um, owned and, and operated too with uh, grandchildren. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. Correct. and that's fantastic. So yeah. um, when you think of kind of the Cabernet that is coming out in the past, I guess, decade or so, what is what was the style goal of, of has, has how has Joseph Phelps evolved on um, that style over the past 10, 20 years? Sure. I think we've evolved in the sense that we're getting smarter and better and we use technology if we wish um, for certain areas, whether it's in the vineyard or in winemaking. And that's made us more efficient and able to get sort of the product that we want. Um, I think really it goes back to the vineyards, which Joe knew really well. He knew early on that the key to making great wine was to have great land. And he was a really fine wine collector. I mean, he had a cellar that was just incredible. And I think he knew, he knew what had to be done to make the right wine. So as he purchased vineyards and, you know, for sure our, um, our brands have changed over the years. I mean, we used to mostly be a white wine house with a little bit of Cabernet and a little bit of Pinot Noir and Zinfandel. And now it's pretty much, it's opposite. And it's, you know, we're 90 to 95% Cabernet based. Mm -hmm. So we realized quickly, I think what grew well in the Napa Valley. And I think, um, I think the Napa Valley really lends to amazing Cabernets as we're all showing today. Cabernets that are age worthy, Cabernets that have in you know nine and a half out of ten years, we're very lucky with our weather, and we have great color and tannin development that lend to that age worthiness. So, um, just kind of going into this wine and kind of talking about uh, this particular wine that we have of just where are you sourcing the Cabernet grapes? Because I know you go to a few different places. Where are they coming from? Yes. So um, most of our Cabernet for our Napa Valley Cabernet comes from a vineyard that we own in South Napa and also our St. Helena home ranch is what I'll refer to it as. And then trickling in the other um, sort of five vineyards are two vineyards that we have in Stag's Leap, a vineyard that we have in Rutherford and two vineyards that we have in Oak Knoll. And so it's the combination of all of those and a few select grower vineyards that we have in the blend. <clears throat> okay, and you're doing that to provide are you looking for consistency? Or are you trying to just kind of, um, is that the goal? Well, I think our goal has always been the consistency and having mm -hmm. the amount of estate vineyards that we have really offers that to this wine. Mm -hmm. And so, so although we might describe that kind of resulting style, like you're saying, oh, I'm going to get a Joseph Phelps Cabernet and being like, oh, you should expect this. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so let's taste through and talk about what, what we're getting and what, what we could um, get from here. So I think the, the Cab our Cabernets are quite fruity, um, maybe more in the blue fruit category. I love the spice box characteristic. There's always a little hint of a cedar characteristic and maybe like the classic graphite. Um, I think because of where we're located and maybe how our fruit develops on the vine, it tends to lend to maybe some medium to heavy tannins, mm -hmm. which we can really are, are beautiful and more finesse on the palate. They can be fresh in certain years. Um, they can be more closed in certain years, but I think overall, I think this wine is a wine that 
can be consumed early, absolutely. It can age, going back to what I was saying about, I think we're so lucky in Napa Valley to have mostly consistent growing seasons. And we have that ability to get that ripeness that we all want. And that's where sort of the whole package comes into play. And, you know, fermenting, aging, bottling, it's almost there already. Although we all put our tweak in fermenting and aging and yeah. blending. I love the nose on this, like, cause first it, as it's opened up, I'm getting definitely it's that this blue and um, um, blue and purple fruits are there, but there was also a touch of chocolate mm -hmm. and, and like really subtle smoky undertone that I love. Um, that's probably a little bit of the, the oak, but it's just, I poured early because I love the way it all <laughs> evolves in the glass. So if you're tasting at home, I encourage you to just kind of keep going, come back to it in a half hour. It's always um, evolving. So from an aging, if people wanted to say, I want to, I want to keep a few Joseph Phelps um, bottles. I know you've had a kind of, there's been like a string of great vintages, but you know, in general, if somebody wanted to hold on to a wine, what can they expect? I think that they can expect that the wine will, you know, maybe lose some of the fruity characteristics, but what I always really base, you know, my tasting on is the texture. And I think if the texture is there to begin with, it's going to be there as the wine's aging. So although, you know, some of the color might fall out of solution and some of the fruity characteristics might not be there as prevalent as they are, say, a wine that's 10 years old as it gets into the 20 year, it's just going to continue to have those things, but a little more nuanced, but really the texture that is what, you know, what is going to be there at the end of the day and, and aging. Yeah. I'm always, I, I also want to say is that I, I love Napa Cab usually about the 10 to 15 year because I will have something that's 10 years and I'll think it's maybe it just came out. I'm just always kind of surprised at how well that fruit holds up and then integrates and becomes this beautiful, um, beautiful kind of, there's a more subtlety to it, but it's still really silky and, and delicious. So, um, well, thank you so much. So, um, Joseph Phelps. Um, Next wine we are doing is Duckhorn. Uh, Renee, hello. Thank you so much Hi. for being here. Hi, ladies. Um, yes, you saw the lovely ladies here with some incredible wine. I'm so excited about drinking all these today. So um, Duckhorn, back 43-ish um, years ago, and I only know this because I went to the 40th anniversary and I was 40, and I was like, oh, yay, Duckhorn's as old as me. So um, when, when Duckhorn... Um, you know, kind of founded this winery, what was their vision going in? The Duckhorn. So, Duckhorn Vineyards uh, was established in the 70s. Um, so Dan and Margaret Duckhorn, our founders, um, had spent some time in Bordeaux. They had uh, traveled to Pomerol and St. Emilion, and really their vision was, they fell in love with Merlot. Um, they were excited about the varietal, and at that time, um, nobody was really using Merlot as a standalone varietal. They were really just using it as a blender grape and um, they returned to Napa and really just had the notion that this would be the ideal location to grow and make um, Merlot and really focus on it as a varietal. Um, they had linked up with the Upton brothers, John and Sloan, who owned the Three Palms Vineyard and, and really just kind of fell in love with that site and got really excited about it. And in 1978, we uh, produced our first vintage, and it was 800 cases of Three Palms Merlot and 800 cases of Napa Valley Cab. So even though uh, Duckhorn's kind of been synonymous with Merlot over the years, uh, Napa Cab has really been a part of our foundation, our history for the last 43 years. Um, so the 17 vintage actually marks 40 years for us. Um, one of my favorite aspects of making wine at Duckhorn and working with Cabernet in Napa in particular is that I get to work with so many different ABAs and I get to see the diversity of the valley, just soils and microclimates. It's always so interesting to me to see how a 30 mile span, you know, long and just a few miles wide, it's really one of the smallest growing regions. There's so much diversity here. And it's, it's cool to be able to work with the different pieces of the valley and what that contributes to the blend. So for this wine, um, it's a compilation of our six estate vineyards. So we have um, over 240 acres here in Napa that um, kind of help feed this program from our state vineyards. And they're kind of spread throughout the valley. So um, starting as far north as Calistoga and going all the way down to Napa. And then we also work with some really great grower spots throughout the valley as well. 
And so kind of bringing all those different pieces together to really create the most complex and layered blend that we can. Yeah, so, Nap yeah. Napa's always kind of fascinating to me because it is smaller. It's like that upside down funnel thing. Um, shaped like an hourglass. Kind of, yeah, it's, it's kind of like an hourglass. But yeah, it's um, a little bit thinner top, but, but also with just how many, you know, there's the mountain regions and the valley floor, but the diversity of soils has always been one thing that, that also kind of fascinates me about there. So it's great to be able to select grapes from all over the valley to really add to um, a diverse blend. So for, for Duckhorn, I guess their philosophy or their style goal when making a Cabernet, what are you looking for? So for this wine, I'm really looking for a seamless balance between fruit, oak, and tannins. Um, I'm looking to create a lot of layers and really bring that diversity together into this kind of harmonious, you know, glass of wine. Um, and the focus for our ABAs for this wine are some of our key ABAs are Rutherford, Yonville, um, Calistoga, and a little bit of Oak Knoll. Um, we also have a little bit of a state fruit up on Howe Mountain. So, you know, we're bringing the structure and the depth and complexity from Howe Mountain, and we're blending with that with some of the blue and black fruits from Rutherford and that kind of dusty minerality, and then kind of layering in. Um, Oak Knoll brings in a little bit more of a brighter acidity component, a little bit more red fruit. So ultimately just looking for a lot of layers, a lot of complexity. Um, but when I think of Duckhorn Cab, I think of, I think of classic, and I, I like to um, just kind of note on just oak for this wine, I, I like to use a little bit of restraint when uh, with our oak program, kind of goes back to the same philosophy as like layers and complexity. So um, while we only do about 50% new French oak, we, um, I use about 40 different coopers, 40 different barrel types in this blend. So a lot of different spices kind of in, you know, putting this together and just creating a lot of layers. So oh, fantastic. Yes, I remember I'm being in Bordeaux once and, and visiting a cooperage and seeing a bunch of Napa Valley um, producers on the on the barrels because they stamp them it's like oh wow this is so interesting and they're all, they're all coming um so yeah cooperages and and barrel style is important so let's taste this wine talk us through it tell us about the nose and the palate and everything that we're thinking we're getting here from duckhorn Yeah, I, uh, this wine's definitely, you're going to see a lot of layers. You're going to see a lot of blue, black, and red fruits um, coming together with some nice sweet spices. There's some of that dusty minerality coming through from Rutherford. A um, little bit of kind of subtle savory undertones always kind of popping through. This is going to be a wine that is definitely approachable upon release, but kind of hits its stride depending on the vintage, at probably like the 7 to 10 or 12 year mark. Um, it's certainly a wine that you can lay down and age. Um, it is cab, but we do a little bit of blending. We add a little Merlot for that mid palate, that mm -hmm. kind of fleshy supple notes, a little touch of Petit Verdot for that kind of inky, darker structure and long-term kind of ageability. So just really kind of looking to bring those pieces together to just to allow for something that will kind of show well on both ends of, of the aging spectrum. Yeah, there are definitely those layers that I'm getting and then the really um, kind of integrated tannins coming through and touch of licorice that comes through for me too, but. Yeah, a little um, nice note of anise there. 17 was a, a nice vintage. It, it, I mean, there's showing like a lot of polish and a lot of um, just kind of bright, juicy acidity on the finish, the 16 too, which just really got this nice kind of juiciness that allows for a long, long finish. Long finish. So think about, thinking of aging for, for duck horn calves, you know, this vintage, maybe, you know, just, in the teens, you know, the 16, 17s. Um, when somebody's thinking about putting one of these down, what are your thoughts on that ageability and that time frame and what to expect? Yeah, I mean, I would, um, you know, the great thing about Napa Cab is, you know, it's certainly not short on fruit. For me, what makes a wine age really well is you kind of look at the, the core pieces to the puzzle, right? You're looking at tannins um, or the structure and framework of the wine, you're looking at the fruit um, and you're looking at the acidity. And so what you start with and kind of how those evolve over the years is really going to kind of show you where you end. So obviously if you're start starting with a, a great, um, you know, you're starting with those three pieces being in balance, then typically they kind of continue to evolve at that rate. And you're going to end up with a wine that shows well, you know, 10, 15 years down the line. 
Um, if you have a vintage that maybe is shy on fruit or is maybe a little bit higher pH and the acidity is not there, then those are going to kind of continue to fall off over time. Um, I think 16, 17 is two great vintages that are going to show well. There's plenty of fruit. The acidity is there. Um, they're giving, but they have the framework to kind of last. It kind of last for a while. Yeah. Um, great. Well, this is delicious. Thank you so much um, for sharing and being here. Um, our third wine is from Chimney Rock with the lovely Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Such a pleasure and so fun to see these ladies. And I, I have to just point out, like normally we see each other uh, at events and stuff regularly throughout the year. So it's, it's, it's particularly sweet to see them here because, because of the pandemic, we all have, we haven't seen each other. So it's really yeah. nice to be here. Yeah. And, and we, uh, can, we can do like a, um, you know, a, a subtle like happy hour after this and we'll just all <laughs> finish all these wines together and it'll be great. Um, no, it is. It's, it's good. I, it's exciting to see. I know that in Napa, there's so much great camaraderie and partnerships and um, that goes on between winemakers. And so Ooh, it's one of the best uh, secrets, actually. Right. I know. Don't tell anyone. Um, so Chimney Rock, Cabernet Sauvignon, this specifically is from the Stag's Leap District. Um, so when Chimney Rock was founded, it was founded in this stunning property in the Stag's Leap district what was kind of the idea of of the founding of chimney rock here in this specific area of napa valley yeah so hack and stella wilson came to napa valley searching for a super premium property they wanted to grow grapes they lived in south africa for many years they were collectors and uh it's interesting because they arrived here pre uh development of some of the sub avas so they purchased this 140 acre estate um, 10 years before it became an AVA. Wow. So at the time, you know, Hack's idea was let's make great wine, planted mostly Cabernet, planted some Chardonnay, some Sauvignon Blanc. That time wasn't really thinking what suits, what, you know, what suits this particular piece of land or the climate, just sort of varieties that were popular, et cetera. Um, and you sort of see an evolution. So Doug Fletcher arrives as winemaker um, in the third vintage of, of the winery. And soon after we had Phylloxera on the property. And I always call Phylloxera on the property kind of the first blessing uh, for our estate because um, everything had to be replanted and it allowed time to think about what made sense. And at this point, we're kind of we kind of know Paris tasting results. There's a there there here for Cabernet. Um, does it really make sense to plant Chardonnay or something in Blanc? No. So Doug Fletcher, who was my predecessor here, did an amazing job um, looking at the topography of our estate. And we have hillside, we have Valley Four, we have the north end of the estate is closer to the Palisades. Um, and so a little bit warmer, the south end is a little bit more influenced by the San Pablo Bay cooling breezes. So Doug did soil pits everywhere um, and uh, figures out what clones, variety of root stocks to really optimize what he gets out of each of these blocks. Now, they only planted half of the estate. And um, I think the next step of Tuna Rock's evolution comes with the Trilado family. So Hack's kids are not interested in uh, running the business. Uh, they seek to find a partner, somebody who will keep uh, building on the reputation and invest. So the Trilados come in and uh, they are just visionary. This is when they're just getting into the business of buying wineries. They've been in the wine business for many, many decades and in importing and, um, it, you know, uh, marketing agency, uh, retailers, they've done it all. Um, and so uh, Tony and his sons mean business. And so they developed the second half of the property. And at this point, we know what the there, there of Stag's Leap is. And we continue to do um, our homework and really optimize what we plant where. Um, and so the property now is planted to about 80% Cabernet, about 12% Merlot. Little Cab Franc, Little Petit Verdot. Um, and that really makes sense for Stag's Leap District. Um, and I think the vision changed um, as the Trilados took over because they really made it so that we were going to be exclusively Stag's Leap District 
and tell the story of this ADA in the most pure way that we could. Uh, and I think that's kind of their vision to be family owned, run, estate grown, and dedicated to the AVA and trying to produce quintessential sets of district cow. Fantastic. So, so leading into that, and yes, the Trollhunters are very good at, at everything they do. So you're all estate grown here in Stag's Leap. What is that classic Stag's Leap style? Yeah. So I mean, you can define it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think of the texture of Stag's Leap as mm -hmm. what really distinguishes it. I think there is um, a silkiness and velvetiness to the tannins. That's uh, there's a certain finesse. Uh, they're they're not um, they're not grow hair on your chest kind of Cabernet. There's kind of this balance of power and grace that I see in Stag's Leap. Mm -hmm. uh, and not to say that the other AVAs don't have that as well, but I think there's a very, you know, when you, when you taste the texture of a Stag's Leap cab, it's kind of um, unmistakable to me. So, so let's, and, let's, and, let's... and by the way, there are some differences throughout Stag's Leap, right? It's mm -hmm. three miles long, one mile wide. The north end is a little warmer. We're at the southeast corner, which is a little cooler. Uh, so I think each of us has a slightly different expression. But my goal is really to tell a tale of these vineyards in a given vintage. So that's what I want our wines to say. Like if you taste a 2011 Estate Cabernet, which is the wine that we're going to taste, um, you're going to see that it was a cool vintage. Uh, yeah. and, and that's important because, you know, we want to tell the tale of this place in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's let's go through and, and taste that because I know um, you know uh, it's interesting because I think that both uh, styles are so important and welcomed of having you know one where you're blending throughout the valley to kind of take in a little bit of everything, and then you have what you're doing is that that one very specific um, uh, space. So let's taste through this and kind of talk us through uh, tasting. Yeah, so. Pretty typical, I think, of Stag's Leap is kind of that blackberry, sort of black cherry driven fruit, some cassis as well. Those are kind of the fruit characters. It's interesting, from the north end, we get more of the black fruit character. From the south cooler end, a little bit more of the red fruit. So there's a little bit of both here. Um, in addition, and I think this is also unmistakably Stag's to me, even 17, which was a relatively warm year for us, um, there's still a little bit of that savory character, some dried herbs, a little bit of maybe dried sage or thyme, you know, and so that adds some really beautiful layers. It's not just ripe fruit, but you've got um, some other sorts of characters there. Oh, I, yeah, I got the sage. And right? then, oh, that sage yeah. and thyme, that kind of yeah. fresh herb or dried herb garden. And then again, just like uh, I think Renee and um, Ashley's wines, approachable now, but this has the acid and the structure to go. Um, mm -hmm. I think you, you see the texture that I'm talking about, Stag's Leaf, yeah. just a little bit of that silkiness. It's a. Uh, um, uh, Karen McNeil, uh, I was just talking to her yesterday, and she used the reference that she used for um, Stag Leap District Tannins was cashmere pajamas, which I mm -hmm. love. I thought I was like, I like that. Oh, yeah. She was on last Thursday, hanging out with us, talking about uh, Pinot Noir. So very cool. <laughs> yeah, I like cashmere pajamas. I like that. Yeah. And um, one more thing about this wine is I do take a sort of conservative approach to the use of new oak, mm -hmm. only 50% new oak here. Mm -hmm. I really want the fruit to shine through, really want to tell kind of the tale of vintage and vineyard and not let oak um, kind of over, overpower that. Yeah, it is a beautiful wine. I think I was mentioning earlier, I have a I think an 08 hanging out for me at some point. So I'm very excited um, to try that. So um, thank you. These were Delicious, obviously quintessential Napa Valley Cabernet, each with its own style and uh, flair. But a couple of things I also wanted to ask all of you about. Um, one thing is talking a little bit about the, the region and your wineries adapting to this changing climate. So in terms of temperature differences, it's getting warmer, grapes are getting riper, um, but also the fires that have been occurring these past few years. Uh, there seems to be now a fire season, unfortunately. Uh, they've been coming each fall. 
and just kind of how either your winery or, or you see the region adapting to these kinds of changes. So uh, Ashley, can I, I was going to start with you there on your thoughts on that. Um, I think it's a great question. I don't think we all have the answers. I think it's sort of a work in progress. Those are thoughts, but just thoughts are just... Mm. I feel like um, in my tenure at Joseph Phelps, I feel like we really have been able to anticipate and react quicker as we see the climate, the climate changing. Um, and it certainly is changing. I, I mean, we saw that this year with such a warm and dry season that we were handed that we have to be really pliable and work with what we have. Um, and so I think as we replant and as we improve technology in the vineyards, we're able, as I mentioned, to react a little bit quicker. Um, as we're replanting, we might be changing our architecture in the vineyard, our row orientation, I think all of which has helped us immensely um, to get through some of the heat spells that have happened over the past few years. Um, that we're investigating in some micro misters. We don't have them currently, but in future vineyard replants, we are gonna add them probably, which I think is a good thing. What and are just, Sorry. I think it, the anticipation of what's to come, whether it's yeah. the fire, which it has happened too often to all of us and to know how to react quick. And I think that's what makes us strong winemakers. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, being able to adapt. So um, Renee, what about you at Duckhorn? Yeah, just your, think, your thoughts on, on Napa as a whole too. Yeah, you know, I think Ashley touched on a lot of, uh, you know, it's climate change is inevitable. It's unpredictable. Um, it's, it's not something you can really plan for, but it's something that you want to be prepared for. And, and a lot of that is just your, your mental state, right? Your, um, your ability to adapt and to be versatile and to kind of pivot into just, um, just kind of move it with the flow. I mean, the bottom line is, is winemaking is, is obviously highly affected by mother nature and, um, and it's all about timing and whether that's, you know, a, a change in, you know, your picking decision or just an extended kind of flowering period or a late bud break or whatever it is, you're constantly, you know, having to kind of move and, and, and pivot with those changes. And, and I think um, climate change just, you know, it, it's just, it's something that's happening and it's, it's more of an extreme, right? So you're taking that mindset and, and you're kind of um, just adapting quicker, I guess. Um, you know, the fires, um, it's, it was a challenging vintage, but I'm always up for a good challenge. And it's just, again, it's just something that you kind of have to learn to get good at. And this is something mm -hmm. that, you know, hopefully we don't see again, but um, as winemakers in the Valley, we have so many good winemakers here. And I have no doubt that um, we're going to be able to produce some great wines out of 2020. And it's really just going to be a function of people being able to adapt, pe people being able to be flexible and, um, and just using that knowledge and base that, that we've had over many, many years and just putting out some great wines. So, you know, it's, it's something that we all just have to deal with, right? I guess they say rolling with the punches, something. Roll with the punches. Exactly. Along those lines, rolling with the fire. So, um, but I'm, glad, I'm glad all of you are, are safe with that. Um, but yeah, that's something to get used to. So Elizabeth, what are, what are your thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, I think just a couple of things to add to what the ladies um, so eloquently said. Um, you know, we've also, Napa Valley has been amazingly, uh, I think, forward thinking in terms of reducing carbon footprint for quite a while. For a few decades now, in fact, in fact, I think all three of our wineries are Napa Green certified, uh, and I think that's an important component of this climate change uh, thought: is how do we continue to reduce our carbon footprint so that um, maybe we can impact what our climate change is right over time? Um, I think. Yeah, we've definitely seen an evolution in the way we look at vineyards. I remember when I got out of Davis, you know, one of the common practices was you remove leaves everywhere, no matter what, um, and just open the canopy up. We don't do that anymore. We're much more conservative. Um, you might do it on the morning side. It depends on the road direction. You know, remove leaves at your own peril. So I think, you know, we... And, and this is one of the best parts about, I think, working as a winemaker in Napa Valley, the collaboration that happens between all of us, you know, fires happen, we're all tasting each other's wines, we're talking about what are you seeing, what are you seeing, what are you doing, um, and that really, I think, allows us to evolve collectively 
and really um, empower each other to, to face some of the challenges ahead. Yeah, that's super important. Great point. Um, thank you for that. I do want to end on um, a happy note. <laughs> so uh, we're coming into the holidays. This is our, our last 2020 um, video. And I wanted to ask you all about just holiday wine picks. If you're not drinking your own wine or maybe even these other um, colleagues' wines, what uh, what wines do you do you drink during the season for festive times? Uh, Ashley, go. I'll start with you. Okay, I um, you know I that's a hard question because there's so many amazing wines that I love that aren't from Napa Valley. But I think what I might have on my holiday table this year is some Bionic Frog from my good awesome. dear friend Christoph Baron, and I love his wines. We're good friends, and he's an awesome winemaker. Yeah, he's a character. Yeah, good choice. Um, Renee, what about you? Um, for me, I, you know, I always reach for something that I don't make in house. Uh, it's probably going to be a Pinot from out in Russian river, maybe like a Hartford court Pinot, which mm -hmm. is some of my favorite or a Syrah, maybe a GSM blend or something. Those are good too. Those I always, I think of those as like, I call those Christmas wines sometimes, especially yeah. the Australian GSM blends. They have this like Christmas spice they, to them. They do. They have Christmas. Perfect for Christmas. Yes. Perfect choice. Um, Elizabeth? Um, well, I'm pretty champagne obsessed year round, but it definitely comes to a new height during the holidays. So, um, you know, I'm going to get as many bottles of bubbles as I can. And, you know, whether it's Bollinger or Simon, uh, you know, Bilcart Simon or the Rosé, I love that. Um, the Piper Heitzig, which I, is one of our house champagnes. Yeah. So, yep. Great. Yeah. I'm all on board with champagne and, and Pinot and GSMs and um bionic frog if i i think i still have one from a long time ago i might have to break that out but um well thank you ladies so much for being here and talking about these incredible wines an incredible place um just all three very impressive and well done hope everyone at home enjoyed diving into learning a little bit about the intricate details into making these fantastic napa cabernets if you didn't have a chance um, they're still available, like I said, on wine.com. They're great gifts if you're feeling generous. I just keep it for yourself if you can. It'll be delicious through the, the holidays. Um, but again, ladies, thank you so much again for your uh, time and, and expertise. And thank you. Please keep making such great Thank you so thank much. You. It's thank such a much. pleasure to be here. Great. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, Happy Cheers, ladies. Bye. Cheers out there. Enjoy. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice. And now, our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com. Seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.